concept drawings are drawings um, that are not really fully working drawings. They haven't. They're not fully dimensioned. They haven't got all the details on there. They just basically have a floor plan as a concept. They might have one or two elevations. They'll show the roof. They'll show the external materials. They'll certainly show the internal walls and how big the rooms are and the room names. They'll have window sizes on it, but they're not. They're not fully dimensioned working drawings. We utilise concept drawings ourselves so that we can give them to a quantity surveyor. They're just detailed enough for him to give us probably a 95% accurate cost plan without all of the expense of going to the full-blown working drawings, you know, with all the engineering and everything else. They're just a concept drawing, but it's enough to get us to the next stage of, of a proper cost plan. The architectural drawings um, or working drawings are the full set of drawings which allow somebody to actually build the house um, and there's a lot more detail in terms of you know how the walls go together and the truss details and you know all of the timber sizes and all of that you've got section details through the house that's the more fully dimensioned all the way around uh, you may also have a lot more elevations internally of all your bathroom and kitchen layouts so that the cabinet makers and electricians and tilers know exactly where to rough in all of their you know pipes to and where to lay their tiles to so the, the, the working drawings or architectural drawings are quite a lot more elaborate than just a concept drawing. The concept drawing again would be more utilised where you just need to get a reasonably accurate uh, picture of your home so that you can get a cost put against it. For example, if anyone's ever done a planning permit application, a planning permit set of drawings is not a full working set of drawings. There's a lot of detail missing but it's enough to get a planning permit. A planning permit set of drawings is almost enough for a concept plan. We would add a few more details, but not many more. We would suggest that after you've got a full cost plan done and that you can be sure that you can afford to build that home as it's designed from your concept drawing. What can often happen is the, uh, the cost plan will be complete on your concept and you'll go, wow, that's probably a little bit over my budget. Where can I, where can I cut cost? Well, with a detailed cost plan, you can decide which lines you want to actually edit, which lines you want to do yourself, which lines you need to lean on a mates for to do extra work for nothing, etc, etc. And then if you can't get your cost down, you have no option but to change your design, reduce the size of the house, and not necessarily start again, but basically reduce your expectations. At some point in time, <coughs> budget and expectations need to meet. So we would recommend that you don't get your architectural drawings done or working drawings complete until you're absolutely certain that you can afford to build the design that you've got. A kit home, I describe it as um, like a model kit that if you went down to the news agent and bought a model aeroplane to put together at home, you've got a box and it's got all the bits in there and some basic instructions. So you take it home, you pull all the bits off, you glue them together and then the model works. It's exactly the same with a kit home. You get a box, which is a container, and it's got or, you know, a flat tray truck, and it delivers all of the bits, and you put them together. Now, many people confuse a kit home with a transportable home, which is something that's manufactured in a factory on a truck and craned off in one piece. That's not a kit home. A kit home is a model kit. It's all in pieces with some instructions, and you put it together. Absolutely it can and that's one area that uh, we do quite a bit of in that people will come with a custom design, they don't want to go with a standard project home design from any of the large builders and, and you know they're great designs and many of the builders are very reputable but they want something original and, and unique and, and there's nothing wrong with that. In order to do that then we can create a custom kit which is basically a kit of materials to lock up stage which is just only for that house because it's never going to be built again. It's just a customised kit. Lock-up stage is where the house is weatherproof and watertight, which means that you would have your floor system in place, be it concrete slab or timber floor. You would have wall frames, roof trusses, the roofing is on, the, the gutters and downpipes are on, the eaves are in, the external wall cladding is done with either bricks or, 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 or other, other cladding. All of your windows are in and the front and back door are in so that the house is secure from any intruders and vermin and it's also uh, watertight or weatherproof.
these days everybody needs special reports and not the least of which will be a soil report um, or geotechnical report and that's where you get your soil classification from. Um, often there are other reports that need to be done and this is where again we would recommend that people really do a lot of research before they start investing money even in concept drawings. Do some research on the block of land, on your planning schemes, on all the relevant authorities and find out exactly where they are. For example if you're building too close to an easement or near an easement you need to actually find out exactly where the pipes are in that easement because if you're within a metre of the pipe you need to get a special uh, you know, report or uh, dispensation from the relevant authority. Now the easement might be two metres from the boundary, that is the area of land that's put aside for the people that own the pipes that are in it and they can dig that up at any time. However, what can often happen is while the easement is two metres wide, the actual pipe is 2.4 metres out. So if the pipe's actually in your land, you still can't build within a metre of that pipe without permission from the relevant authority. Um, and this also can increase dramatically the cost of construction. So these are the things that you can find out before you spend any money even on concept drawings. You can find all this information out and then that can shape your design because you can keep well away from those sort of areas. Most of them are fairly well known um, and you would get what's known as a depth and offset report. Um, most local councils, although they're a little bit more unreliable than the sewage authorities, they will know their depth and offset. So you nominate the block, you pay a fee, and they will tell you that you've got a 150 millimetre diameter PVC uh, sewer main that is 3.5 metres deep and it's 2.1 metres off the boundary. So they will generally tell you that if it's an amusement. The other pipes that you know are your own pipes connected to your house, and that's a different plan that you buy from the sewage authority, that's just a property sewage plan. If there's an existing house on the land, you may well have services in there, but generally, depending how old the house is, you'd have to be very really careful about whether or not you could use those services. They just might be too old. Uh, they might be old, you know, vitreous clay pipes that might be just full of roots. So it's better usually just to cut them out and just relay new piping back to the point of attachment. You are, I think in all states in Australia, you are restricted to how many you can build. Um, in Queensland and New South Wales, I believe it's six, uh, so it's one every six years. In Victoria, it's one every three years as an owner builder on your land. Now that's uh, a restriction that's been brought in because many people were actually own a building, but just building spec homes. So they were classified as being in the business of building. When they weren't, they were then going as owner builders and they were avoiding a lot of the other regulatory uh, constraints that are there to try and you know, minimise problems in the industry. So the governments have decided that they need to regulate owner builders. The genuine owner builder who's building their own home to live in doesn't really need to build more than one every three or four years. As a builder, we would be on site at least every day or at the most every second day, depending on what was happening on site. As an owner builder, we would recommend that you would need to really be on site at least yeah, if not every day, every second day, but certainly for an hour or so in the morning. The morning is the best time because the new trades will start in the morning. So if you can organise your work schedule so that you maybe a bit of flexi time or maybe some holidays or whatever, but if you can organise to have an hour or two every morning that you can work on your home, either on site or in your home office, then you'll be going a long way towards success. If you've got a full-time job and you leave home at 7 o'clock and come home at 7 o'clock and you've got no time in between, then I can assure you that owner building is going to be a real challenge.